<laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Challenger Jacko and welcome back to the channel as we take on Sonic 06 to see where it's possible to beat the game without encountering any glitches. But before we begin, if you love Sonic content or challenge videos in general and you want to see more content like this on the channel, do me a favour and smash the subscribe button, like the video and hit that naughty bell. We're now on the road to 2k subscribers by the end of the year and any help to hit that goal is truly appreciated. Now, without any further ado, let's jump straight in. Now the rules for this challenge are going to be pretty different from what we're already used to. For one, this is a one-shot challenge, meaning there's no restarting of any kind. The moment we encounter a glitch, the run is over. The goal for this challenge isn't necessarily completion. Theoretically, you can beat any game glitchless. What I am looking to answer here is how realistic it actually is to accomplish this. What if someone randomly picks up the game one day and played it normally? How far could they potentially go? The next thing we need to clarify is the definition of a glitch. This can be summed up as a usually minor malfunction or unexpected defect. To put this simply, a malfunction that prevents the game from functioning as intended. To put this into perspective, the event where Knuckles and Rouge can randomly find themselves stuck to the wall is a glitch. It's not intended and it's not consistent to how the game should run. However, for the sake of this challenge, Sonic's energy meter is not considered a glitch. Whilst the infinite gem energy isn't intentional by any means, it remains consistent at all times. You will never encounter a situation where you can drain Sonic's energy bar, aside from the isolated stages with Elise. So despite this not being an intentional mechanic, in this unfinished state of the game, it is consistent across the board. Our adventure begins in the beautiful town of Venice, I mean Soliana, during the Festival of the Sun. Apparently these pale looking aliens worship a deity that can control the sands of time, quite literally out of fear due to the potential of its power running wild and destroying the world. So of course Dr. Eggman discovers this and crashes the festival, sporting a new getup, which would make you think that he's running in the next North Korean election. Who thought that adding golden nipples to his jacket would be a good idea? Anyway, he seems to believe that the Princess Elise holds the secret to the power of Solaris known as the Flames of Disaster, as well as the Chaos Emerald. Before he could do anything of note though, Sonic Hellbent on Rainy on his parade steps in, in one of the most badass opening sequences in the series to date. For as much flack as this game gets when it comes to Sonic's dual portrayal, something I do agree with, this scene in particular truly oozes the sauce that made the early 2000s era so exciting. From the musical score to Sonic's style on Eggman's mechs, he literally just kicks one off the platform with his toe for god's sake. This small scene encapsulates the confidence and swear that Sonic had during his peak, so it just makes me question what the hell happened for the rest of the game. Whilst managing to escape for the time being, the pair are caught not soon after, as they are ambushed by three of the mechs that Sonic just teabagged moments ago. Instead of just killing them, this marks the first example of Sonic being a dumbass in this game, as he places her down whilst he takes on the mechs, providing Eggman enough time to grab Elise and make off with her. Elise does give the Chaos Emerald to Sonic however, as he vows to save her, watching on doing absolutely nothing to help her as the egg carrier slowly escapes to the point that he waits until the day after, before he actually takes the initiative to go and save her. Are you really trying to tell me the guy that pulled Chaos of Control out of his ass with a fake emerald couldn't do anything to save her now? Now accompanied by his two-tailed best friend, the two set off on their quest to save the princess. Now the path to Wave Ocean is blocked off by a vast sea of water, connecting the pier to the stage entrance with a ring trail. To cross this we need the light speed dash, a move we don't have at the start of the game. To obtain it we need to buy an upgrade from the shop, hence the winder of the shoemaker mission. In all 6 to earn currency so we can buy the upgrades, we can either complete the stages themselves, or tackle the variety of missions littered around Soliana, and you can tell where they are pretty easily by the blue markers on the map. This first mission isn't anything special, just your go through the ring mission that all Don't Sapphire games seem to have. There isn't much potential for glitches here, but I did notice just how sensitive Sonic controls are in this game. Now, I've been playing a bunch of Project 06 recently, and I didn't really notice the nuances in the control until I came back to retail for the challenge. I'm not even going to lie, I don't think I could ever come back to this casually, but now that we have the light speed dash, we enter the first real stage of the challenge, Wave Ocean. Now, if Wave Ocean isn't a callback to Emerald Coast, then I don't know what is. Myself and many others give this series so much flat nowadays, for the constant nostalgia pandering that has Plague Sonic since the 2010s, but no, the 2000s era is also guilty of this, albeit to a lesser extent. This stage is pretty much just a bigger emerald course. Whilst it has some new gimmicks such as the water sliding, you still have a lot of features from the adventure stage, like the orca chase and the lighthouse. 
In order to progress through this challenge as much as possible, my strategy was to essentially play this incredibly safe, whether that's by slowly inching our way through the level to avoid any potential bullshit, or just to straight up stray away from any of the combat encounters. For a game that is this unpolished to the point where just by playing as intended is enough to break it completely, giving the game the least amount of chances to shit the bed just seems like a decent strategy. And to be honest, it appeared to be working as we reached the Arca Chase segment without any problems. With Sonic now hanging on for dear life, we have to play as Tails in order to activate a switch later in the stage. There's no way to sugarcoat this, Tails absolutely sucks in this game, which is pretty much the case with almost every single character that isn't Sonic or Blaze. For one, he's incredibly slow, falls like a rock after flying, and can't even attack enemies directly as he doesn't have his tail swipe, nor can you even jump into mechs without taking damage either. Tails' his only method of attack is through the dummy bomb rings from Heroes. To use them, you pretty much have to stop dead in your tracks and aim your throws into the enemies. What's worse is that we don't even have a reticle, so it's pretty much a case of trial and error, leaving you exposed to the countless attacks of the mechs. So fuck all of that. You have enough space to straight up avoid all the enemies, and as soon as we fly up to the switch, we have reached the final portion of the stage. In this final section of Wave Ocean, and a few select stages for its Sonic's campaign, we'll enter a state that kind of feels like a prototype of the boost, known as the max speed sections. Simply put, in this state, Sonic is continuously moving forward at max speed. He can't slow down and his control is extremely restrictive. Seriously, you can't even alter your trajectory mid-air in this state. Not to mention if Sonic does as much as stub his toe, you're most likely dying as a result. Interestingly enough, you can use the light speed dash as a means of lining you up with the oncoming road, as Sonic snaps along the trailer rings, which gives us a bit more control over his rapid speed. The caveat with this is that we end up gaining a ton of speed as a result, so in the end, as long as you just stick to the ground and don't touch anything other than the analog stick, we can clear the stage with no issues. Oh, by by the way, I never see anyone else take this route towards the end with the ramp. It looks like you can't even get to it because of the army of the mech standing guard, but all you literally have to do is hold left and Sonic will weave in between them. It's a pretty nice shortcut that gives us a clear shot to the goal ring. With Eggman escaping with the princess to another castle, the duo return to Soliana in order to collect some intel on the Doctor's secret base. In reality, we just had to save a kid who somehow managed to get herself stuck on the rooftop. Did she use the spring to get here? How did she not break her legs? Obviously, it's not as simple as just reaching the roof, as we need to slide under an extremely thin gap to reach the spring. Now, you can kind of do this by using the spin kick, but I didn't want to take the chance in breaking the game so early on. So, we just take the intended route by purchasing the anti-gravity upgrade. This ability allows Sonic to slide across the ground for a limited period of time. Instead of having momentum tied to this door, he just keeps on going regardless of the terrain you're traversing through. Upon saving the kid, we discover that Eggman is currently holding the princess captive in the dusty desert, bringing us to the first boss encounter of the run, the Egg Cerberus. Being a guard dog with a single head despite being clearly molded after a creature that has three, this boss really doesn't pose any significant threat to the run, aside from the way we need to approach him. The Egg Cerberus is invulnerable to our attacks directly because of its armour. In order to deal damage, we need to follow the thing from behind, and use the grind rails to reach the bread pole sticking over its head. By doing this, we can control the mechanical moat directly, leading him into one of the walls to deal about a quarter of its health. Fun fact, if you're able to direct the thing into the statues rather than the wall itself, this deals double damage allowing you to end the fight in about 2 hits, which is rather confusing to me, as you'd figure that a solid wall has more potential to deal any lasting damage compared to fragile stone. I swear that this boss fight is simply unfinished though, it all stems from Sonic's quote in the second phase of the fight. Once the Egg Cerberus has reached half its health, the armour protecting its head falls apart, and Sonic's line kind of implies that we can potentially tap the head to deal damage. However, upon doing so, nothing actually happens, so I have no idea what gives. Going forward though, you can reach the red pole far easier by home and attack chaining the head and scaling up the boss that way, but with that, we were able to move on. Now, Dusty Desert is quite an interesting stage for Sonic at least. With Elise now safe, we're introduced to yet another playstyle, where we have to carry Elise throughout the stage, making use of a glowy shield orb thing to cross over quicksand and the various rivers throughout the two Elise stages. Naturally, this limits Sonic technically, but not really. During these stages, we no longer have access to the spin dash or spin kick. Considering how useless both of these moves actually are though, this limitation really doesn't feel like a handicap. Sonic's meter actually functions correctly here tied to the use of Elise's ability. It's pretty cool as along with the ability to float over various terrain, it also serves as a shield that allows us to play through enemies at high speeds. Well, at least that's what it was intended to do. Sometimes this does actually occur and you will kill the mechs without an issue, whilst on the other occasion, Occasion, Sonic will take damage slowing us down as a result. Again, I have no idea what causes this to be so inconsistent. I'm just going to chalk it up to the unfinished state of the game. Fortunately, this stage is relatively short, so not a lot can really go wrong as long as you play your cards right. 
Instead of tenting fate, I decide to take the upper pathway via the rising pillars, and this allows us to skip a chunk of the stage due to the rainbow ring. Using the combination of gun mechs and Eggman's own boss to hold an intact chain our way to the upper pathway, we take the spring that we unlock from the cage to reach the next section, doing our best to avoid the rising spike walls at all costs. The final part of the stage pretty much forces us to scale a spiralling pathway filled with various obstacles and mechs. Just to be safe, run past everything in your way, and use the small ledge of the moving platforms to reach the spring. Once we've cleared out the final wave of enemies, and use the light speed dash to cross the bottomless pit, Dusty Desert is quite easy to beat glitchless surprisingly. Venturing through a scenery what I can only assume is the desktop background for Windows XP, we are given a little bit of expedition on the history of Soliana, and the customs of worshipping a god that always appears hellbent on killing the very people that bow to it in the first place, as well as a little glimpse into the interesting dynamic between Sonic and Elise. Ok I'm not about to defend the love thing because it's absolutely stupid, but I will defend the contrast between Sonic's freedom loving attitude and Elise's reserved nature because because of her sheltered upbringing. It's cool to see how Sonic is able to bring out a side of Elise that she didn't even know she had, as she becomes more adventurous as the story progresses. That aspect of their relationship is something I will always defend as it feels authentic. Returning to Soliano, we are confronted by a strange hedgehog representing the 420 cult, and through the use of his cyclokinesis, ambushes Sonic with the intent on killing the ablest trigger. Sonic obviously having no idea what the hell he's talking about, takes on his new fort in the dining area of the city. Now this rival encounter is rather infamous in and outside of the Sonic community because of the absurd bullshit he expect from you this early in the game. That and well It's no use! It's no use! It's no use! It's, it's no, no use! use. Aside from the very start of the battle where Silver stupidly jumps into the air for some reason, if you try to take him on directly as per the rival fights in the previous games, he will fuck you right up. This is because of his psychic abilities, if this man grabs you at any point you might as well restart. Because of the invisible hitbox around the arena and the abysmal iframes, if he hits you into a corner at any point, whether it's the ceiling of the arena or the surrounding walls, he will continue to immobilise you and throw you over and over until you die or you restart in the case of a soft lock. If you're unfortunate, he can even throw you out in a way that Sonic clips outside of the arena and he sent hurdling into the void of space. I'm not even joking, so how do we even approach this? Fortunately for us, Silver, whilst a man of many talents, is a bit on the slow side, opting to snipe us at range by picking up the various tables and chairs and launching them at us. So we just need to run away until his audio crew plays. At that point, he will no longer be able to grab us whilst holding the other objects, giving us an opening to attack. As long as you immediately run away upon landing, we can gradually whittle down his health until we defeat Silver unscathed. Despite getting the best of the weed head, Sonic makes dumbass decision number two, letting his guard down long enough for the psycho hedgehog to land the sheep shot, throwing his back into the wall. With Elise now recaptured by Eggman, Sonic's fate appeared sealed, until Amy comes out of nowhere, preventing Silver from dealing any further damage finding Sonic enough time to escape. With little to no leads, we encounter a group of young misfits dubbed as the Soliana boys. It's just a generic group of kids trying to play a hero and they challenge us to a mission in which we have to find the six kids scattered across the hub world. Even after all of these years, this mission still takes me a few tries to beat. It's such a bizarre difficulty curve for how early we are in the game, and for all of the wrong reasons as well. The goal itself isn't too difficult per se, we just have to find the six kids, but it's the circumstances around the goal that truly ups the ante. For one, the kids are incredibly generic in design. You'll know when you see one as they're running around mindlessly, but there's nothing about them that stand apart, so they tend to blend in with the already uninspired world of Soliana. We also only have 5 minutes, which doesn't seem too bad, however Sonic moves incredibly slow in this game, and this area of the hub world alone is around the size of all 3 of the adventure hub worlds put together, and unlike the adventure hub worlds where they made up for the lack of size with incredibly eye catcher and interesting locales that really helps you in knowing where you are at all times, everything in this world looks the same. I feel like if they made Sonic slightly faster, this mission wouldn't be as bad. It's just the bland world design and other bizarre design choices makes this a mission I'll be happy to never play again. Once we've dealt with those brats, Knuckles calls us to the warehouse located in Soliana's dock area. However, the door is locked until we encounter the most incompetent police force I think I've ever witnessed in my life. You see this utter melt? Well, he's the captain of this task force, and he will only let you through if you discover who the real captain is forcing us to talk to every single one of these wankers to try and figure out who is the real deal, whilst her princess is currently captured by a man, seeking to release the wrath of their sun god and use that power for himself. 
Why are you so bad at your job? This next hub area is where I got genuinely scared, I'm not even gonna lie. There's this really bizarre glitch that can occur sometimes where the partner AI for whatever reason just curls up along the ground and dies for no reason. Whilst this can happen everywhere theoretically, from my testing it's this area specifically where this normally occurs. So in order to avoid this we just need to travel from point A to B as fast as humanly possible, discovering that the warehouse has been taken over by Eggman's mechs. This really isn't that bad and nothing interesting happened either, well unless you count 2 minutes of constant homing attacks by being interesting. Knuckles clearly could not be arsed in dealing with Eggman's bullshit, as he's been here the entire time, passing on the message that if we want to save Elise, we need to take the Chaos Emerald to Eggman's base in the White Acropolis. Before that though, we need to take ourselves to the other side of the map, making sure we do this as fast as possible to avoid the previously mentioned glitch. Once we reach the base, we are yet again ambushed by another wave of mechs that are incredibly easy to kill. This literally took a few seconds, guys. Remember how in the previous games, the snowboarding sections actually had physics, decent control, trick animations, or I don't know, a break button? White Acropolis has none of that. The snowboarding in this game is honestly absurd. Sonic in these sections has no semblance of physics whatsoever. He will instead move in the direction you point him in, regardless of whether it's uphill or not, meaning it's incredibly easy to softlock yourself on an incline. Also, if you crash into a wall at any point, similarly to the max B sections, he'll just start tumbling around until you regain control. Our best Bet he is just to avoid everything in the way. I wouldn't even recommend really trying to go for the shortcuts via the ramps either, as that can bring about a whole lot of new problems. Upon reaching the snowball chase, you will need to hold down on the analog stick rather than up, which can be awkward to transition to because of the camera. As a kid, I always died at this section as we need to do a trick jump over a botanist pit. Unlike the adventure games though, where there would be a designated trick ramp clearly outlining where you'll need to jump, in all six itself, they are baked into the environment, and so it becomes incredibly hard to find the correct timing. Once once we've cleared the gap, the next section of the stage revolves around sneaking throughout the base, whilst taking out wave after wave of enemies. You have these spotlights that will ring an alarm alerting the mechs to your presence, something you can destroy by scaling to the top with a homing attack chain. It's just way easier to avoid them altogether though, and since we need to activate switches usually hidden under ice, you're better off avoiding the enemies altogether, getting out of here as fast as we can. In the next section we regain control of Tails for a brief stealth section, so there are these laser gates that can only be deactivated by destroying the searchlights with the dummy bombs. They also expect us to take out the waves of enemies as they can and will get in our way as we try to aim our shots at the lights. Now Tails' flight has been incredibly nerfed compared to his adventure counterpart, rather than gaining altitude indefinitely until he tires out. In all 6 he will only gain it for a set amount of time and then simply maintain that until he drops like a rock. As a whole this feels far less versatile but it doesn't really matter in this case. I don't believe they were intending this whatsoever, but if you jump from a higher point you can fly over the laser gates with no problem. So you don't even need to bother with this and upon activating the switch we return to Sonic for the final portion of the stage. The final section of White Acropolis can be summed up as a Box. You have so many different routes with enemies, rails and other gimmicks where you just have to try and figure out your way through. It can be confusing at first, however the goal ring is up on the hill towards the left side of the map, so we just gotta find our way through which isn't that bad if you make use of the grind rail placed along the centre of the map. But be careful of the slide bottomless pit they hide as you dash towards a curved wall, since it's really easy to fall for it if you didn't know about it beforehand. Overall though, White Acropolis is quite easy to be glitchless, as long as you avoid most of the encounters. Reaching the heart of the base, the trio are inspired by the mad scientist, as he traps them in the machine he dubs the Solaris prototype. With the ability to control the flow of time itself, Eggman sends our three heroes on a one way trip across time, to the era of a destroyed future. I know a bunch of people have an issue with Eggman's portrayal in 06, comparing him to that of a James Bond villain, but I quite honestly like this take of Eggman personally, as at least he actually does something. Think about it this way, it's sheer coincidence that Shadow and Rouge just so happen to be in the same era as Team Sonic. If Eggman sent them to any other point in history, they wouldn't have been capable of getting back. He's very similar to his Sonic Adventure 2 counter part, just with a far more subdued personality. It definitely felt more natural in Sonic Adventure 2 because we actually got to experience his actions throughout the gameplay, rather than here where he does a thing off screen and you just have to be okay with it. But I do like this karma take on Eggman, he feels more credible as a villain in my opinion. Anyway, after arriving in this desolate future, we run into both Rouge and Shadow, who have been sent here by another villain who we will not be mentioning. It's... Mephilis the Dark. 
In order to return to their own timeline, the Five need to initiate a space-time rift, something that is possible through the use of Shadow's own chaos control. With only one emerald though, the required energy to pull this off is far too great, forcing the two teams to work together in order to find two emeralds scattered around this ruined future, leading to the next stage of this run, Crisis City. I'm not alone in the sense that whenever you think of this game, it's either Kingdom Valley or this stage that pops into your head, right? Crisis City is iconic for both good and also absurd reasons. As for the good, we're forced to traverse through this hellscape of a world, with fire enemies running havoc across the various deserted highways and skyscrapers, destroying windows and causing the fragile roads to crack and crumble underneath their weight. It's a really cool setting that I wish we saw more of nowadays. The first portion of the stage is another one of the snowboarding sections, with a lot more to actively dodge this time around. Not only do you have to weave in between the debris and flames themselves, but the ablest monsters have the habit of hiding on the ground until the last moment. It's really satisfying to pull this section off without taking damage, especially if you perform a trick jump and successfully land on the rails with a minuscule hitbox. Seriously, you can land literally millimetres away from the rail and you still won't land on it, it's utterly ridiculous. To be honest, everything was going great, we were avoiding every obstacle and I wasn't really expecting anything to go wrong. Until this happened. Yeah, you saw that right. We took damage and despite having over 40 rings at the time, the ablest monster somehow killed us with a glitch, bringing the first part of this run to a close, as it doesn't appear possible to realistically beat all six without encountering a glitch. This is such an anticlimactic way to end the video, but that's the point of this entire challenge. Yeah, whilst I could technically restart the stage again and just pretend that it didn't happen, unlike the Ringless series where you can simply restart the stage to try again, as it resets the state and the objects, in this case we've already encountered a glitch, restarting doesn't change that. And as I stated before, my interest in this challenge wasn't really the prospect of beating it, it was to answer the question of how far someone could realistically get in this game without it falling apart, and so I'm content with ending it off here. I honestly expected this run to be over before the silver encounter, so reaching almost the midpoint of Sonic's campaign is quite amazing. In the next video we'll be taking on Silver's story to see how far we can get through his campaign, and without jinxing it I do suspect that we may be able to get way farther in that one simply because of how methodical and slow his playstyle is in comparison. Comparison. I feel like with a slower character that will give the game less of a chance to poo the bed, but I've been wrong before. So before I sign off, as always I want to thank you all for watching the video and of course the love and support you bring to this channel on a daily basis. It's awesome to see the interaction and the comments flow in, it just makes this whole hobby worthwhile, so thank you. And if you have any challenge ideas that you'd like to see me tackle, please bring them to my attention. I can't promise that I'll get to them all right away, but they will come over time in between the major releases during the slower months. With that said, I've taken up enough of your time, so take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye bye for now.